Good morning again. Good morning. And we want to thank you for coming to our first African American Truck Farming Roundtable. Most of the truck farms are from Northern Anne Arundel County. And we want to thank the library for letting us use the building this morning. John Kelly from the Anne Arundel Trust for Preservation and Miss Betty Mack for all the work she's done from NACAPS. Uh, we want to thank the truck family farmers for bringing, in, bringing us the legacy of their family in truck farming. From the Gaither family, Mr. Irvin E. Gaither will be presenting. The Hines family, Mrs. Joyce White. From the Matthews family, Mr. Sidney Matthews. From the Sewell family, Mr. Edgar Sewell, Jr. From, we're waiting on one, hope we'll get that Sims family, he's not here right now. Michael Sims, hope he'll be coming soon. And Spencer, Anthony Spencer will be doing double duty because he's related to a lot of families here in Anne <laughs> County. He's from the Spencer family and the Williams family. We will have a question and answer period after Mr. Fin Mr. Spencer speaks. And then um, Mr. Irvin E. Gaither will give us a wrap up. But before we begin, I want to read you a quote from one, from one of our elder members, Lucille Wright Cook. It can be found in our book, Trail Tracks and Tarmacs. She said, there were farms around and we children had to go into the fields and pick in the summer. I always remember on Monday mornings, we had to get out there 5, 5.30 in the morning to get the load ready to go to market. First thing, we picked all summer, she said. We had to walk every place. And Mrs. Cook said this when she was 90. She lived to be 100 years old. And I went to her 100th birthday party. Okay, we have a time constraint. Mrs. Vivian Gis Spencer, raise your hand, Ms. Spencer. She will let you know when you have one minute left to speak. Thank you. And we're going to go in the order listed here on our program. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. And um, I thank you for inviting me to share some of the stories of my family. So I'm actually going to tell the story of two families. Um, uh, one is the Gaither family on my mother's side, um, because my mother's a Gaither. And one is the Jackson family, which is on my father's side. And the reason why I decided to do that was because the Jackson, family, or Jackson farm was actually here in Linthicum Heights. And so that was the reason why I decided to add them on as, as a part of this uh, presentation. Now, I, I want to tell you a little bit briefly about truck farming, because it's one of the terms that's used often, and I think we get this idea that that's the reason why we drive pickup trucks, is because we, use, we did truck farming. And actually, um, truck farming comes from the North French word trocaire, which means to barter or to share. And so you have to understand that families often, um, you know, 150 years ago, um, they could farm, they could feed their families, but there were often things that they couldn't buy or couldn't make at home, and they may not have had money to buy them. So they would barter um, eggs and, and, and different produce so that they could buy the things that they could not make at home. And so that is the reason why we came up with the term truck farming. I think here in Anne Arundel County, truck farm is often looked at as um, synonymous with the use of picker's checks. Um, which is not a uniquely Anne Arundel County thing, it was actually something that was done in Europe. And because so many pickers came from Baltimore, they were familiar with that system, and they utilized the system of pickers checks here in Anne Arundel County and in, in the state of Maryland, and in a couple of different parts of the country as well. So first I'm going to talk about the Summerfield Jackson Farm. Um, Summerfield Jackson Farm land from the turn of the century to his death, his son Wesley farmed the property until it was annexed by the state um, to build Friendship Airport, which is now BWI. And the Jackson Farmhouse was located at what is now the in intersection of Elkridge Landing Road and West Nursey Road. So if you imagine where um, the Holiday Inn is or where the NSA 
NX is over, uh, you know, just south of here, that is exactly where their farm was. And it actually ran along Camp Mead Road all the way down across from where Northrop Grumman is today. So it was a relatively large farm. And it was a traditional Anne Arundel County truck farm. Foods that were grown there were transported into Baltimore City for sale in the markets to feed people who lived there. And they grew the traditional vegetables and fruits for this area. Uh, green pod peas, lima beans, corn, cabbage, tomatoes, summer squash, green beans, pumpkins, green peppers, Anne Arundel musk melons, which are very popular in this area, watermelon, and strawberries. Um, one of the things that I remember as a, as a child, not, the farm was long gone, but the Jackson farm had a spring on it that was a flowing artesian well. So there was water that bubbled up naturally through this sand basin. And it was kind of located right where I-195 runs across today. So I imagine about 35, 40,000 years, that spring is going to bubble up right outside of there. <laughs> but that's, that's just a dream that I have, that that will come back again. The family had a farmhouse. They had a smokehouse, they had a meat house, they had a barn, and they had a chicken house because they had to feed their family based on what they raised on the farm. There was a two-horse mule wagon that was kept inside of the barn because that was the only transportation they had. And they utilized that transportation to get food either from the, from the farm into Baltimore or down to the, um, to the river uh, for shipment into Baltimore. And Summerfield used workers from Baltimore to plant weed and pick vegetables on his farms. And he had picker's checks. And that's the reason why we know that he did that, because he had picker's checks. So the other farm that I want to speak about is the Jeremiah Gaither farm. And so that's the farm that's on my mom's side. So Jeremiah Gaither purchased a farm in Severn, Maryland, after working in Elkridge, Maryland, probably at the Ellicott um, Iron Works. Um, so he worked there before the Civil War, and likely until the forge was destroyed by the flood. And then the farm was located at the corner of Old Telegraph Road and Queenstown Road, um, near the Smith Farm, and was approximately 50 acres. So Jeremiah was a truck farmer, and he grew, at minimum, peas and strawberries at this farm. We actually don't have a lot of details about what he grew at his farm, because it's kind of limited in our family. Um, but we do know that his farm was long enough, large enough and he was a truck farmer because he had picker shacks. And um, so we do know he grew peas and we knew he grew um, strawberries because we have those picker shacks that line up with those, um, those vegetables. Uh, after Jeremiah passed away, uh, both actually Jeremiah passed away in 18, or 1917 and his son Hiram, who is my grandfather's father, um, died six months later. So my grandfather took over that farm at what is now 796 Queenstown Road. And he and his wife Thelma had 15 children, all of whom worked on the farm and all of whom worked as pickers on local farms, especially at Hawkins Farm, which was right across Telegraph Road from their farm. So the boys did work throughout the season. So they plowed and prepared fields, they did planting, they did weeding and picking. As my mother says, the girls did the lighter work. They did planting and they did picking only. Um, so, but it was still hard work, I can tell you that, because if you've ever bent over picking green beans, it was hard work. Um, but both the boys and the girls picked wood because that's how they kept their house warm. And they did all the work around that farm to keep their family um, working and, and, and living and thriving. And they did thrive, I can tell you that. And many of them are still with us today. So the vegetables grown at the Gaither farm were green beans, corn, tomatoes, squash, and peppers. Uh, fruits included cantaloupe, watermelon, apples, and pears. And Reginald and his sons didn't run what they called a traditional truck farm. They did not have picker's checks. Um, it was a small farm, it was about 10 acres. Um, but they did supplement the family's income with what they grew on the farm. Uh, his farm animals include a mule, a couple of cows, some pigs, and chickens. Uh, and obviously there was a house, there was a barn for the mule, uh, there were pig pens, and there was a meat smokehouse. As noted, the children worked summers picking uh, the fields in the Severn area. The girls mostly picked at Hawkins Farm because it was very close to the house, and they also picked at Boyer's 
um, when they needed um, peaches picked when they got raped. Um, and I think many of you probably know where Boyer's Farm is just off of Severn Road or where it was. Um, the boys would do hoeing and weeding at farms in the area and occasionally they were driven as far uh, to the east as Gibson Island. Uh, they would go to Freetown and they would even go into Howard County. And you have to see that as children, my mother's brothers and sisters were the migrant farm workers of today. So the local farms did work together. So Farmer Hawkins was just across the, the, the road there. He knew who was working on his farm. And so he would allow my grandfather and his sons to use his horses when they needed to, because the horse was much easier to use than the, uh, than the mule. Um, and so they, uh, Jeremiah actually, um, my mother's great grandfather, actually used to work with Farmer Smith. And so they would prepare their fields together. They would share um, plows and animals in order to make sure that those fields were prepared. And so that was kind of interesting because Farmer Smith was a white farmer and Jeremiah was a black farmer, but when, when, when there was work to be done and they could share and they could both get things done equitably, they did that. Um, so other local farmers in the area were the Smiths, the Rays, the Boyers, the Phelps, the Wagners, the Matthews, the Hawkins, and the Bussies. And I have pictures available, so maybe later you all like to see. I have pictures of, this is my uh, great-grandfather, Summerfield Jackson. This is his wife, uh, Emma um, Francis Hines Jackson. And I just met one of my cousins sitting right next to me. And that's one of my cousins, and that's one of my cousins, and that's one of my cousins. We're all very close, well, if not closely related, we're all related here in this area. If you're from North County and you're African American, you have some relation. Uh, this is my Uncle Wesley, or my great Uncle Wesley, who actually um, was the last person who farmed um, on, that, uh, on the property there. And this is my uh, grandmother Inez, who was a child of uh, Summerfield Jackson. And these are his pickers checks and a picture of the farm. And uh, I have some other pictures here. Uh, there's actually a, the wagon actually still exists. And uh, it was uh, redone about 25 years ago. So these are some pictures of that wagon. It was built in the 1880s by a company in Akron, Ohio. There's a little picture of that as well. And this is a picture of Jeremiah and Gaither and his wife, Fanny. And we're all like sort of interrelated. I think there are a couple of relations here with Fanny as well, here in the room. So, and a couple of copies of his pictures checks. If you'd like to get a little um, closer look at these, feel free to come to me after um, we have the presentation completed. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I was going to ask all of the Heinz family about to raise their hand, but if I did that, everybody would have their hands. So, <laughs> so, so, but I'm so glad to meet my cousin here, and I will be visiting him, because I said, I, I'm sorry that I did not get more information from my mother and my aunts and, and my grandmother, because now we're older, and my children hardly know anything, and my grandchildren. So it's good that we can pass this on, and we can let them know how blessed we were, and they appreciate where we are right now. But I'm the fifth generation Hines here. Uh, my grandpa, I'll call him grandpa and grandma because that's what we always refer to him even now today. We don't say Charles or Matilda like some would call. You better not call them Charles or Matilda at that time. But it's grandpa and grandma, that's an affectionate term we gave to them. Uh, they were uh, truck farmers. Grandpa was one of the ones that started the Hines farm. and it's, the location was 5743 Belgrove Road, and the, it's still there. He was very instrumental in building up uh, Pum the Pumphrey community. And he did not keep it to himself or just for his family. He shared it with the whole community. And in 19, um, 
he had, he used he made an agreement to use 97 acres of property in that area and after seven years the year of completion he was able to officially purchase it in 1912 from Mary and Susanna Hammond he farmed it he worked it but it was underdeveloped when uh, Grandpa took over. He would cut down trees during the day. He would uh, clear the debris so he could have the property to build his home. And that home house was there for many a year. And I still look over in that section where uh, the home used to be because that was our playground. That was our reunion place. That was just a place to go and get love from Grandma and Grandpa. And sometimes Mama would say they didn't even want to go home. They would make up, they would sleep because they didn't want to go home. They wanted to stay there with Grandma. That's how love was. There was no strangers there. there you were no visitors. You were just family when you came on the property. Grandpa farmed about 70 acres. Uh, there was cabbage, tomatoes, strawberries, corn, apples, beans, whatever you could eat, they farmed it. Uh, during the 20s, during the peak season in the summertime, I remember there was a big two-story building, and we called it the shanty, but that was the place where migrant workers came in and worked his farm during the summertime. Uh, the females lived on the top floor, and then the males were on the first floor, but they would be there during the summertime to harvest for him. I was told that uh, Grandpa had two mules, two horses, and the wagon he used to transport his produce to uh, the market down where the Baltimore Harbor is now. Uh, he would go there, sell, but God bless uh, Grandpa uh, in 1932 to be able to purchase a truck. He didn't discontinue farming, but now he had upgraded to a truck. And he took his produce down to the harbor to sell. There was an article in the Sun paper talking about him not only as a farmer, but as a businessman. He knew how to handle, how to improve, how to increase. He uh, was able to have chickens, and I remember going out to the chicken coop to get fresh eggs from the chickens. He had hogs in the fall, and I, I think sometimes they still do. Farmers would go from farm to farm, help slaughter the pigs, take care of the meat. We always had fresh meat. Uh, <laughs> He would, there were some families that had, were large families in the community. Grandpa would make sure each one of those large families got a whole hog to take them through the winter. Uh, there were trees. He had apple orchards they called back in the corner, but it would run from where the house was all the way back once to Hammond's Lane. And many people survived after those farm vegetables and fruits and trees. But then there was also what we called a family orchard right beside where my, mother, my grandmother's house is today. All types of apple trees were there. When you go to the store and see your gala apples, and you know they're the expensive kind, we could go and pick as many as we wanted to. <laughs> he also had what, I don't know if he developed this yellow tree, apple tree himself, because it was yellow apples that we see in the store, but it tasted almost like bananas. He was a man of vision, and he had a, uh, we could go over and pick our apples and have apple parties. Uh, but the trees up the back in the corner, as they referred to it, were for ev anybody. He sold apples, but he never said that people in the community could not pick apples and share them. He was all for giving back to the community. Now, the farm, as uh, Grandpa farmed it, ended in 1942. But I still remember the farm going on because some of the people were still picking and me one day thought I was going to earn money. And he had the picker's chips. I found some and I put them away so, you know, to be secure. I secured them from myself. <laughs> <laughs> I went to look for them. I went to bring them today to show you. I have to go back to one of these houses and found, find out where I put those picker's <laughs> chips. And they had different denominations as they would pick. They would bring their baskets to a certain location, and they would be paid from the amount that they had on those chips. They were very interested. I'm going to find those chips, y'all, and, 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 <laughs> and share them. Uh, but we were a blessed uh, family. We uh, blessed the community and the church, and all of the children were blessed. Grandpa left us a legacy for them to live up to, and right now, the sixth generation of Heinzes still live on that same property. Uh, he donated uh, property to the uh, Board of Education, Anne Arundel County Board of Education, 
and uh, that's where the Lord Kiesa Center stands now. It was probably elementary school, but he wanted his children to be blessed uh, educationally, and he also wanted to share that with others. And so often today, we miss that concept. It's not just me and mine. It's everybody. It's the family. And so he shared and taught us how to share, and it has come on down. You never left Grandma and Grandpa's house hungry, and you have a goodie bag to take home with you. That has come down the line, even in my children. If you go there, if there's something there, you'll eat. And you can take with you, and everyone is welcome. That's what Grandpa and Grandma instilled in us to pass down from generation to generation. The question of the Hines family, if you have any, my cousin and I over here, we are going to be talking. Because <laughs> last night, Bobby and uh, Bobby, uh, we were talking about uh, Lydia, Grandpa's mother. I said, we, I said, I've got to get back on here at the census, and I have some information. And we started talking about different things. But we are going to, as a family, we need to come together and share so that our younger generation below me will know who our great forefathers were, foremothers, and be a proud of what they have instilled in us. Also, uh, for generations to come, uh, we can share that it's not just keeping to yourself. And we see so much going on in the schools, and, and it bothers me. I said, I've been crying for two days looking at the news. I have to cut the news off now because I know how it is. We had to go from here to Annapolis to go to school. And some are blessed that they can walk to school right now and don't want to go. Take, we need to instill them. Take advantage of every opportunity. Grandma and Grandpa didn't have it, but they shared what they had so that others could be educated by donating a property to, to have the school built. We had a, uh, Grandpa had one horse left, <laughs> and his name was Barney. <laughs> and I was told that Barney came from North Dakota, and he was a gentle horse, but Grandpa also had one mean one. He died early, I'm, you know. <laughs> but Barney would let us ride him around the farm. We could get into the wagon and just relax. We could go and pick and ride all through the woods. And some of the uh, community members still have their homes on the Hines property. So his legacy, it still goes on. So what we do today will have everlasting effects so we have to be mindful, and I try to tell my children, be mindful of how you treat people, what you do, the company that you keep, because it will show your integrity, who you are, what you're made of, and always be willing to share what you have. Grandma and Grandpa did a marvelous job. I'm bragging on them because I'm a product of what they have instilled, and now I can pass it on what they taught me. Don't be stingy. Don't hold on, because when you share, you will receive. And Mr. Wesley is one of the ones that's on, uh, living on the Hines property. Mr. Wesley just celebrated his 100th birth, 100th birthday. That's a product of the property community. And he grew up with my family members. And they know how to work, to, how they work together. Be able to share. When you go to the store, know that we had a lot, we had a good life as a farmer, and my grandson, they called him, my son, they called him farmer one time because he worked on the farm, picking and selling. They called him, and my grand, grandson, farmer. But that's a proud term. Truck farming was important to the development of Anne Arundel County, and don't let anyone demean what it stands for. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sidney Matthews. I'm here to represent the Matthews family portion of truck farming, even though um, I could represent the Queen family also, <laughs> because they did truck farming too, and there's my mother here, she's a queen, but I'm here to represent the um, Matthews. Um, we did truck farming in Anne Arundel County in what is now called Arundel Mills, but it's Hanover, Harmon's area and it's located in what is still called Matthews Town on Matthews Town Road. And when I go a lot of places and I have to give people my address and they look at my name and they say, well, you own? I said, no, I do not. 
I still pay taxes. <laughs> and if I don't, the county owns. <laughs> so we lived on, on um, about 10 acres, which my grandfather purchased in, on, in fact, on April 12, 1943, he purchased 10 acres from, in a mortgage sale from his cousin, Russell Matthews, who purchased it, purchased it before him in 1938. So Russell Matthews owned this property from 1938 to 1943. And my grandfather, who was Costello Matthews, bought it in 1943 for 10 acres for the grand total of $400. I don't think you can buy too much <laughs> land in this part of Anaconda County now for $400. Um, The size of the land was 10 acres. We lived on the land, myself, my, my parents, my brother, and my sister. And we helped my grandfather farm the land. And as I can remember, my grandfather and his grandchildren were the only people working on that land. We didn't have anyone coming in to help us. Or, and as um, I can recall, a lot of the work fell to uh, my cousin back here, Winston, myself, my, my brother and my sister and my other two cousins, Denise and Darcel, sometimes they come over and help. Uh, farming activities included picking, planting, but before you picked, what you had to do was, you know, what you do now is you go, you go somewhere and buy plants to, to pick, to, to uh, plant. But what you had to do before was you had a, a hotbed that you, that, you, that you started in like mid-March and you planted seeds. If you wanted tomato plants, you had to plant tomato seeds in, in a cup or anything and, and cover it with a, with a big glass sash so that we get heat from the sunlight, cover it up every night with, um, with pine needles to, to keep it warm, and, and wait for those plants to get big enough in mid-June so you could plant those plants, any kind of plant, tomato plant, um, squash plant, cantaloupes, any kind of plant you were planting, sometimes we planted from seeds, but but a lot of times you had to plant plants from from a hotbed. There was nowhere to buy buy your plants. And after you planted the plants, what, what, we we loved to go to school. We loved to go to school because if you weren't going to school, you were out there on that farm. <laughs> and when school ended at at at, at the at the, um, the first part of June. We used, we used to walk to school, to Harmons Elementary. When we came from school and walked, we used to walk over hill and walk over the hill, we could see my grandfather waiting for us. <laughs> so you had to drop whatever you had, change those clothes, and, and get out there and start planting. And everybody helped to plant. After, after you planted, you had to, um, some, some of the um, chores that we had to do was, one of the ones I used to hate to do was, Bug tomatoes. See, so we had um, lime dust and some kind of other chemical dust that you used to put on them, but they always had bugs on them. And so, we, uh, you know, every day, every day you had to go out there, I don't care how big that field was, you had to pick those bugs off of those tomatoes, put them in a, a, a little jar, something filled with gasoline or something to, to kill them. And sometimes me and my brother, we, we go, go through there and just knock them off, you know, they just go back on the plants, but that's some of the kind of things you had to do. We had to um, get up early in the morning, whether you had school or not school, and feed those pigs. We always had um, three, five pigs, and you had to get up early and feed those pigs every day. And when you got home from school, you had to feed those pigs, feed them and water them. And I remember one time, it, it, was, it was hot that day, and I just wanted to go and play. So I said, well, my father won't be home for a minute, so I'm going to go up and play a little ball here. And I said, well, I'm, I'll, I'll feed the pigs a little later. And I was playing ball, and I, I could hear the sound of his truck coming. <laughs> I said, oh, my Lord, I didn't feed those pigs. <laughs> and he got down, and he was down at that pig pen, and did you feed the pigs today? Yes, sir, I did. Well, they don't look like they've been fed. Well, 
I fed him. I, you know, I don't know what happened to the, you know, it was, it was a lie that, that he, that he died with. <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't, after he got older and I got older, I wouldn't even tell the truth on that. I could, I was scared of what I might get. Um, the, and after you raise your crops, one of, one of the big things I remember about farming in Anne Arundel County was, especially smaller or larger farms, the big deal was getting, getting your tomatoes right before 4th of July. If you got your tomatoes before the market, before 4th of July, you got prime price for your tomatoes. And, and, and tomatoes was a big crop for, for this part of Anne Arundel County. And anybody around Maryland would tell you that. And the market was down, downtown. The wholesale market was downtown then. And it was basically run, hmm? and it was basically run by Italians. Italians. And, and we always had a good relationship with those Italians and the stuff that we brought to the market and, and the stuff that we um, purchased from the market. Uh, we used a, a truck. We always used a truck. My grandfather always had a truck. We never had pickers checks because um, I don't think we got paid too much for picking. <laughs> but uh, but we, never, we never did want for anything to eat, you know, because my mother canned everything. People canned things back then. You did, the stores weren't, the closest store was um, Glen Burnie. And, you know, nobody's going to Glen Burnie to buy stuff all the time. So people, people canned things. So nothing, nothing went to waste on your farm. Uh, I used to love in December when we would slaughter the pigs because for, for a couple of months I wouldn't have to get up early <laughs> in the morning, cold, hot, whatever, and feed those pigs. I used to love that, that, that time of year. And it, it gave us food. And one of the chores I had to do was cultivating with a mule. We had mules. We had mules. Uh, my, grand, my grandfather bought a tractor later on, but we still had mules. And, and, and I had to learn at an early age, I would say around 10, 9 or 10, to cultivate, to go down the middle of this road, this cultivator pulled by this mule without digging up that row of stuff. I, I dug up a row because I couldn't control him. But but I learned learned I learned how to do that. It, it was it was it was more difficult than it than it looked. It was a lot more difficult. Uh, one of the things I do remember about truck farming was we we sold our vegetables. Um, we a wrapped we a wrapped a lot, we a wrapped a lot in Baltimore. We had a particular spot that we a wrapped at for some twenty five years, which was in front of a, a slaughterhouse, an old slaughterhouse, where they slaughtered pigs at, and, and they sold the meat retail. And we used to sit there across the street, and people would come out with their bags of meat, and we'd be right there with the vegetables for them. Uh, some things we would, we would buy downtown at the wholesale market, like some fruits, oranges, bananas, and things. And people would always ask, did you raise this? Did you raise this? And my grandfather would say, yes, we raised it. And I say, I said, well, granddad, we didn't raise it. He said, we raised it from the ground to the truck. He said, I said, I said okay, I got it. You know, it's, it's, just, it's a sales technique, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. But there was always something to do on the farm, always something to do. There was never a... a I don't have anything to do moment. In fact, you, you, you got so you would not say, I don't have anything to do, because you, they give you something to do. Oh, yeah. But I, I grew up good. Had a good time. Had a good time truck farming. Had a good time living on that farm. In fact, it's where I live today. Right? It's where I live today. I do a little bit of farming, not, I do a little bit of gardening. <laughs> right. I don't do a, I don't do any farming. I do a little bit of gardening, but um, and that that's it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I was trying to get my sister to do this, <laughs> along with my aunt, but unfortunately, they was a little under the weather. 
Uh, I'm going to go back to 1890 when my great grandfather was, when he left from La Plata, Maryland in 1980, 1880, I'm sorry, with an ox and a cart, and he moved to Harmons, Maryland. And can you imagine leaving from Charles County, coming to Harmons, no hotels, no motels, <laughs> nowhere to sleep? They did the best they could do. And they ended up in Harmons, Maryland, and my grandfather lived on the farm of Rodney Shipley. Rodney Shipley is on the Ridge Road, and Rodney Shipley had about 80 acres of land. And my grandfather and them, they were, my great-grandfather, they were sharecroppers. And they were hard workers. So later on, as uh, my great-grandfather's house got a little together, they ventured off. My grandfather, he bought some land from Rodney Shipley where he farmed. My grandfather, as Sid said, my grandfather was a truck farmer. And I can remember early in the morning, I couldn't imagine my, how my grandfather worked. He would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and he would walk from Ridge Road down to the railroad station, catch the train, go to a Washington, D.C., and work. Come home around 3 o'clock in the evening, and we would be ready to go in the fields. And he would get that horse, and I would be standing to myself, I'd tell my cousin, what's wrong with Papa? What's wrong with him? Where he's getting all this energy from to work? And he would plow the fields up and plow the fields up, and then he had a cultivator. And I remember one day, I was about 9 or 10 years old, and I was the oldest grandson. He said, I'm going to teach you how to cultivate. I said, cultivate? Behind this mule? And when you cultivate, you had to pull one line for the horse to go left and, uh, and uh, one line for him to go right. And my grandfather was yelling at me, you're running over the plants. <laughs> Can you imagine what I wanted to tell him? <laughs> but anyway, my grandfather raised uh, tomatoes, peppers, squash, cantaloupes, cucumbers, and sweet potatoes, and also strawberries. And I will never forget strawberries because he gave us six cents a peck for picking strawberries. You had to get on your knees and you had to crawl down in fields and you had to pick strawberries. And we got six cents for them. And my grandfather had a truck. And back in the day, I'm going to say back in the day, I always wanted to learn how to drive a four-speed truck. We was in the field, my cousin and I, we would put the tomatoes on the truck. And they would say, come on, Ed, you get on the truck, you drive the truck. And so you had to release the clutch. And we had all the tomatoes on the truck, and I jerked the truck, and everything came off. <laughs> Here come my grandfather. I said, Lord, Lord, Lord. He said, go home. <laughs> I was so happy to go home. <laughs> but the next day, he told me, he said, come on, we're going back in that field again, and I'm going to teach you how to drive that truck. And that's how I learned how to drive. And... Uh, I had some uncles, Uncle Joe, and Uncle Clarence, and Uncle Ernest. And Uncle Clarence, I never seen nobody work like Uncle Clarence in my life. Uncle Clarence had two mules. He had two mules. And on his farm, he had some people, I guess you could call them sharecroppers, because they worked for him. And Uncle Clarence would get out there in the morning time with them mules, and he would work. And I had another uncle named Uncle Ernest. He lived down further off of Ridge Road, and he was a farmer. And then I had Uncle Joe. He lived on Ridge Road and Dorsey Road. That's where he farmed. And I mean those guys, those men farmed. We had a pump, and the pump was on between Uncle Joe's property and my grandfather's property, and that's where they brought the horses at to water the horses. And we would have to pump the water out of the pump, put it in the trough, so you, uh, the uh, horses could get their water. And I remember my grandfather was saving money. He used to tell all his uh, sons, I'm going to save some money and I'm going to buy me a used tractor. I think I was about 12 years old when my grandfather got his tractor. You thought that, uh, that the Lord had opened up heaven and said, Frank, come on in. 
He was so happy he didn't have to get behind that mirror. And I was happy also. And I can remember one thing that I didn't like to do was clean that horse stable up. You had to get up in the morning, you had to go in that horse stable with a fork, and you had to pile it up in a pile. And then my grandfather would take the truck, put the manure on the truck, and take it to the fields. And when he plowed the fields, it would like open up and you had to take the manure and put it between the rows. And then he would come back with the plow, cover the uh, manure up, and then, like Sid said, we had planted our crops in a hotbed. And with the hotbed, my grandfather would take tomatoes and squash and cantaloupes, and it would grow in plants. And then we would have to take it to the fields, take our hand, open the, the soil up, put the uh, vegetables in and pat it in. And then you had to pull the grass. You had to take a hoe, and you had to go and hoe around the plants and wait till the plants grow. Everybody in Matthews Town, Harmons, Dorsey, everybody wanted to have the first tomato come 4th of July. And they would brag on it. <laughs> my grandfather, would, uh, his brothers would come to the house. Well, Frank, I think I'm going to have my first tomato in about two weeks. My grandfather said, no, I already got a red tomato. <laughs> and from there, we would take the, uh, the uh, produce to the market which is now the Inner Harbor. He would take the plants down there, we would drop them off, and the Italian guys would sell them, and once a month they would send my grandfather a check. And with the check from the farm and the railroad, that paid the bills. And he also raised chickens and pigs. And one thing I'm afraid of today, I don't mess with no chickens. <laughs> I can remember I was, my grandfather had a rooster, and my Uncle Lord, told me, he says, go out there in that hen house and get some eggs. Me, I went out there, I'm throwing stones at the rooster trying to get him to move. That rooster came after me, started <laughs> biting me. <laughs> and that's something I never will forget. So, uh, y'all have to bear with me. My grandfather worked he worked hard during the daytime, but he never gave up going to church. On Sundays, my grandfather went to church. He taught Sunday school. He preached in the old church down here off of uh, Ridge Road, down where the cemetery is. And my grandfather, before my grandfather, he used to tell us all the time, and I never, this is still in my mind now, he was tell us, say, listen, I want, I want all of you guys get right with God now because one day you're going to have to do the same thing that I'm about to do is go home with the Lord. And that sticks in my mind today. And my cousin here, Pat, her mother and my grandfather were sisters and brothers. And they had a large, large family. And they all, everybody farmed, including Uncle Hal, her father, he farmed. Everybody farmed. That's the only work that they didn't they could do only the work they did back in the day. Okay, and I thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Minister Michael R. Sims, of uh, assistant to the pastor at St. Mark United Methodist Church, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Sims family, the Sims farmers, and probably I'm going to segue just a little bit into Matthews. Uh, and you all won't mind it, I don't think. Um, the Sims property, the Sims farm, uh, is a byproduct of the land uh, that was, I'm going to say, sequestered uh, from the various farmers in the Fork, um, Camp Mead Junction area that is now Fort Mead, that is now the NSA. Thomas and Mamie Sims owned a portion of that parcel of land, and they were my great-grandparents. They relocated to 7454 Race Road on approximately 30 acres of land. And uh, they were, everyone else has said so far I'm imagining, they were farmers. 
partly out of their skill set, partly out of necessity to feed um, a large family at that time. Uh, they raised all of the typical crops uh, that some have been mentioned, the tomatoes, uh, corn, um, and, and we talk about truck farmers, but, but as, as my cousin Edgar says over there, uh, I, I never thought of it that way. I always thought we were mule and tractor farmers. I, the, 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 the truck is the byproduct, <laughs> but, but it's the mule and the tractors that was getting the work done. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so uh, with that, uh, my, my, my recollection, first of all, uh, is that my, my uncle, uh, after my grandparents passed away, uh, the land actually went to my grandmother, Maggie Sims Matthews. But because she was a woman, she felt that that was inappropriate for her to run such a large undertaking. So she basically turned it over to her older brother, James Sims. And it was James Sims who did the farming, who who kind of ran everything along with his brother, Herbert. And there were other brothers, but none that really farmed right there locally on the home soil. Now, Uncle Jamie was known for, for many things, and I've heard this said about how fast people worked. Uh, Uncle Jamie, um, depending upon the, he didn't believe in working his mules if it wasn't necessary. If it was something he could do himself, he, didn't, he wouldn't pull his mules out to carry three bushels of beans. So he was well known for carrying one basket on his hip, he'd tie a string around one, he'd carry the other, and you'd see him walking, balancing three bushels, if you know what a bushel looks like, three bushels, of, and he walked so fast. And the reason I bring him up is partially because, because of the, the, the way that he worked, he really allowed me more to watch and learn. Uh, he, I don't think he thought I was up to the challenge to fully participate. Um, and so, uh, and, and I, didn't, I didn't mind that. As I said, he had two mules. Uh, later on, he purchased uh, two tractors. Uh, but in, in the farming part of it, and we talked about the, the uh, produce market, which was in Baltimore, but there was also one in Washington, D.C. Now, my uncles on the Sim side, for some reason, preferred going to the produce market uh, in Washington. And what I found most interesting about it was how, and this is where the truck farming comes in, how they could load a truck. I mean, the produce, my Uncle James had one truck, it was called what they used to call a steak body, which means it had wooden sides on it. And the truck was already probably about five feet tall up to the sides. And when they loaded that truck, they started with the heaviest, least perishable, least delicate produce on the bottom, and they stacked everything up. And when it was loaded, it was like a work of art. Everything was perfectly balanced. On the top were the tomatoes. And I'm told they never lost a tomato going down 295 <laughs> in all those trips that they made. But everything was perfectly balanced. And I was just amazed. I was standing there and just looking, how in the world are they going to get to Washington and not lose anything from their load? But they never ever did. And, and, and let me turn back one sec. The other thing that was very important is preparation of the produce. My uncle, my grandmother, they washed everything. They washed the beets. I helped, I was allowed to do that. I helped wash the beets. Um, to make, uh, string beans have a habit when you pick them. If you never farmed, you don't know this. But they will settle in the basket. And if it's warm, my grandmother used to refer to it as going through a heat. And right dead in the center, you might have one or two handfuls of string beans that would be molded. So before you ship them out, after they were picked, maybe the second day or so, we would get a large canvas and you'd dump out all the string beans so they could get the air they needed. And then the air would you know, keep them fresh and tender. And believe it or not, when you filled that basket back up, you had almost a bushel and a half because of how they had settled in the basket. Now, some people thought, I, I think that we, you know, we were cheating or something like that, but that's just the way it worked. I mean, we couldn't control how the beans settled in the basket, but they did literally settle down that much. And when you repack them, um, that's what you had. The tomatoes, you had a rag. You were wiping your tomatoes off. 
everything had to look its best because when you were going to those produce markets, you wanted them to look at your product and give you the best price, knowing that you had a, you had a reputation. You, know? you, you were going to feed your family with what you were selling. And, and so that was very uh, Im, Im, important. Uh, and, and then just to, I'm going to segue to this part. Uh, also, in, in, on the property where the, where the Sims were, this isn't my segue point yet, um, because there was so much land and my uncle always wanted to have more, he was constantly clearing out the trees. And so he also ended up developing, in his case, a lumber business. He had so much wood piled up at the time of his death, uh, we didn't know, you know if we could sell it all. But that was just by way of necessity of clearing out more land so that he could plant more crops. And he was very good at, people said he could, was one of the fastest people with a handsaw that they had ever seen. Not a two man, but a one man, just yak, 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 back and forth. They raised pigs, like I've heard it said already, and, and all those sorts of things. They just did, a, it was just an amazing time and an amazing era to grow up in. And, and I'm just so blessed that I had that opportunity. Now, I segue into the fact that I mentioned my grandmother, who was Maggie Sims Matthews. Now, Maggie Sims Matthews, and I'm not embarrassed to say this, was an unwed mother. She was the mother of my daddy. And she married Reverend Samuel Matthews. So the Sims are still connected now. She's a Sims. But we moved to Matthews Town. And it was in Matthews Town where I got my hands-on experience, where sometimes working with my cousin Sydney right over there, we'd be out in the field working for two different bosses but having the same assignments. Bugging tomatoes. Didn't like that job. I think we got paid a nickel for a soda bottle. And you could never get all the bugs off the tomato plants. We'd try, and the bottle just looked like it was getting emptier and emptier. And we kept pulling off the bugs, and there were more bugs and more bugs and more bugs. But there were certain skills, because everybody, you know, I'm, I'm not really as into farming as you might think I would be, because I learned a lot. I mean, how to hoe. I mean, to take a hoe and go down that road, there's an art to doing that. You, it's just not moving dirt. It's, 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 it's a hand, a small scale form of cultivation. And from time to time, my grandmother would say, that grass ain't going to pull itself. <laughs> you got to bend over and pull the grass up. Because, all, because the, the, the success of your crop is totally dependent upon, well, you know, scripture says, you know, we plant it, we water it, and God makes it grow. And that's very true. But what they didn't write was, we also have to weed it and cultivate it. And, and so we, 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 we learned at, at, at a very, I learned at a very early age that it was necessary to, to do the cultivating, um, weeding, and just going through the fields, just sometimes just walking through, looking at your crops, seeing what's happening in the field. I mean, you think because they look pretty off a distance, everything's okay. But when you walk down through the, through the field, you find out, hey, a deer was here last night. Or a groundhog, and you have to. There's certain things you have to do. Um, my my favorite thing about about the farming was again uh, getting occasionally to drive my grandmother's car because she didn't. We had a truck, but my father used the truck for work also. So I get to drive the car through the field and help load up the green beans and put them in and drive them up to the house um, and things like that. Um, my, my, I guess my least favorite thing, and I think I heard this mentioned also, was picking string beans. A terrible job for a young person to have to do. And lastly, let me just close up with this, most of the farmers in Anne Arundel County, uh, not only did they go to the big produce market, but we went to a local area market in Baltimore City, the oldest market in Baltimore, which is Holland's Market, it was an open air market with stalls that went four to six blocks on the outside of the market, with canvas covers. I have photographs, did not bring them. And we had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to be ready for business at 6 a.m. Now, sometimes, Sydney and I had just got home <laughs> on the weekend. When it was time, we didn't even get a wink before it was time to go and go to the market. 
So just to summarize, I would say that it was the best of times and the very best of times. Because where Sid and I farmed is where he and I both live today. So I thank God for the opportunity. I thank God for you inviting me. And may we enjoy and hear much more about Maryland truck farmers. I had the distinct pleasure, again, my name is Anthony Jerome Spencer, everyone calls me Tony. I had the distinct pleasure of advertising this morning. I belong to the Northern Arundel Cultural Preservation Society. The acronym is NCAPS. Will the members please stand? NCAPS. That one too. They go by different names depends on, depending on who's speaking. The other is talking about the Dotson and William legacy. Okay. And last but not least, members of the, uh, the Northern Arundel Cultural Preservation Society have teamed with the Anne Arundel County um, Historical Society. And this book on strawberries, peas, and beans speaks very heavily about truck farming. And as one of my cousins said tonight, today, <laughs> everyone here I'm related to. What do you, I'm just find, Sims, we got to talk. <laughs> this book speaks about truck farming, but it explains it as my cousin, Brother Gaither, did. Vegetables, fruits were commodities. It wasn't about the trucks. The trucks weren't invented back in the 1800s. So having said that, I want to push both books. This is being reprinted by the Northern Arundel Culture, no, by the Anne Arundel Historical Society. And this book is the one of two books that the Northern Arundel Culture Society has published. It talks about truck farming in both of them. And that's uh, on page 11 in this book, very heavily. And I just saw my great grandfather in here that I knew his name was, we called him Poppy Lodger. I heard about him. And here it calls him Lodge. He must have been a cool man. I don't know. But a lot of cousins in here that are well, truck farmers um, find that the Hensons, uh, the Johnsons, um, the Halls, the Kess, they're not mentioned in here, but they were all part of that truck farming uh, initiative. I want to go back to the late 1700s, because that's when my great-great-grandfather, James Spencer, who founded Freetown's father, was a slave. And he came to this country in the 1800s when Fort McHenry was being built. It was built by slaves. And when those slaves finished that task, they were given their freedom. So I'm going to mention that. I want to talk about Mr. Jackson. I need to talk to you about uh, Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, because Jackson, Dotson, and Spencer bought a name from a gentleman after they were healed from the infirmary at, in Baltimore, uh, Drew, Drew Hill Park. That was not a park always. It was an infirmary for African-American soldiers in the 39th Regiment. OK. Uh, so I'm going to go back and bring you into the 18th, 1800s when James Spencer was born. His father, uh, we believe, attained his freedom manumitted after building Fort McHenry or, or system with that. James Spencer was born between the years of 1815 and 1820. Why is such a, a wide range? Most blacks didn't have birth certificates because most blacks were property. Those that were free, James Spencer was one that was born free. Still at a certain point had to have a certificate of freedom. November 17th, 1839, James Spencer goes to Annapolis and he gets his certificate of freedom even though he was born free. Those slaves that had been manumitted to freedom, if they were caught out there without this little five by seven piece of paper in their pocket, they were put back in, into slavery. If you were born free and didn't have it in your pocket, you could be put into slavery. But James Spencer was a farmer. And taking the information from the 1880 census, it showed that he had, oh boy, fruit trees, pears, apples, um, peaches. He had everything that my cousin said today. I didn't have to say a word. He said it already. He said it already. But one thing he did have, when he bought his land December 26, 1845, he bought this land from the Smith and the Youngs family. It was called Smith's Forest. Today we call it Molly Creek. When the Spencers owned the land, it was called Spencer's Wharf. It was there that James Spencer parked his sailboats. Now, why was he on the water? Why did a black man have property on the water? Because poor people lived on the water. In Annapolis, where you hear uh, 
uh, where Alex Haley's uh, monument is, that was called Hell's Point because poor whites and blacks lived close to the water. Pinckney Street, Fleet Street, Cornhill Street, a lot of blacks lived down there. And to, coming downtown, blacks owned businesses that were just dissolved during the um, urban removal. You get that? <laughs> OK. So James Spencer, his land that he bought, he bought land this one particular day in Baltimore from a gentleman, um, a white gentleman who has Jackson, a guy named, I'm sorry, Jackson, a guy named Snowden, Dotson, and Spencer to trust them with his money with their money. They did. The next morning, the man came back with an opportunity for them to buy land. The man knew that James Spencer already had land because he bought land from this man in the same area that he had already bought became what became Spencer's Wharf, which went along the waterways up to Curtis Bay over the years as he bought more property. But James Spencer was a farmer. And this is something that most folks don't know, and I, I encourage you all to read about. When black farmers farmed, they had rich soil. They had to work hard. They had to have good products. But when they took it to market, when the white farmers saw how good their products were, they made sure that the black farmers was knocked out of the way. Here it is, y'all. And so the black farmers still had to find a way to keep selling their product. When the white farmers understood that they could not stop the black farmers selling their great product, then they said, let's bring them in together with us. That's how they, that happened. And that's how they started getting along. Black farmers could not just come into their society and say, here I am, I need a booth. No, they had to prove themselves over and over again. So when it came to my grandfather, Samuel Spencer, Ada Henson Spencer was my grandmother. You remember, who said that? Oh, my cousin. OK. You threw me off. OK. We had to farm. Uh, I farmed up until the age 14. I had to find some way to get out of farming. So, <laughs> so I started cutting grass and working at Gibson Island. But Papa Sammy had a name for me. He worked for a guy named Andrew H. Brown, and he called me that. And for short, he called me Andy. And when he called that name, it was to work, OK? To pick something from the fields to help. You know, I didn't get into hoeing and picking weeds, because when I worked for my cousin, Percy Turner, it was Percy, Albert, and Herbert. And person said, boy, that's not a weed, that's a plant. <laughs> so he said, come here, I got a job for you. Just, you just hold here for me. Hold between the plants, get close to them, but the roots down there, don't hit them. He said, boy, you done chopped off three of my plants. Come here, I got another job for you. So I started picking strawberries for him. Now understand something, strawberries, all of the farmers around mostly had strawberries. But he had strawberries at a high rate more than other, other black farmers. What was so important about strawberries? Can anyone tell me? The state of Maryland, specifically the county of Anne Arundel, had the best strawberries in the country. They sold them as far west as Colorado, as far north as Montreal, Canada. So we have something here that's very unique to this county you should be proud of. Um, my cousin Hall, Rachel Hall, helped an awful lot with this information in the book. And another cousin, I want to read this real quick. There were farms around, and we, children, had to go into the fields and pick in the summer. I always remember on Monday mornings, we had to get out there 5 a.m. to 5.30 in the mornings to get that load ready to go to the market. First thing, we picked all summer. We had to walk every place. That was Sarah Cook. Sarah Cook was the granddaughter of James Spencer. But the thing is, we're related, we're, we're connected. I didn't meet some friends until, for instance, uh, my cousin right here, Cheryl Miller, until um, I was on the school board for Anne Arundel County. Started talking, Matthews, family. Kess, family, Johnson, family. Gaither, Williams, Kess, Turner. I don't know that much about, now I have five minutes for the Spencer side, but the Williams side is here too. <laughs> No, I'm not gonna, no, my wife said, oh, really? <laughs> so the farming was very, very uh, large now uh, at homes. I didn't hear anyone speak about it, but Papa Sammy had, on Spencer Road, had his little stand. He sold what he grew locally because he didn't really have a lot to go to Baltimore compared to Cousin Percy Turner. And I would just beg Cousin Percy, man, let me go with you and Charles and Clarence White. Can I go? He said, no, you're too young. No, you're too young. He said, okay, boy, come on, you're going to go with me tonight. 
I went home to my mama. Couldn't Percy gonna let me go to market with him? I slept all the way up. I slept all the way back. He said, okay, boy, it's time to go in your house. Wake up. But he was a person who took the uh, things to the market. Cousin Sammy Gaither, I think, also did. But Percy would take things for Papa Sammy and some other farmers, Mr. Charles Johnson. So uh, there's so much to share. And it's so I'm going to wait for the questions and answers. The Williams family, Vivian Dotson Hall, Janine, and Sylvia, they're my cousins. They are the oldest, as I said a few seconds ago, the oldest great-great-grandchildren of James Spencer. I don't have a lot of information on the Williams family. I thought Cousin Sylvia would have been here today. Cousin Vivian couldn't be here. She has the shingles. And uh, Cousin Sylvia also wasn't feeling well. Cousin Janine can't see very well. They would be the key to answering questions about the Williams families, but we're all connected. And I would encourage you, um, Cousin Vivian is 97 years old, but she is sharp as a tack. And I would encourage you all, if you can, give her a call sometimes. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll be glad to go with you to uh, visit. But she um, has a lot of information. She just can't get around like you are. So I want to thank you for allowing me to share those few tidbits. And we'll try to answer questions when? Now. now. The panel is open. <laughs>